California desert is a land of contrasts and extremes. A land challenging all who enter within its boundaries. A land merciless to those unaware of its dangers. Those plant and animal species found here today survive because they have adapted to the harsh climatic conditions of a land they cannot change. Man, too, unable to control this land, has radically changed his lifestyle in order to remain. Within the boundaries of Joshua Tree National Monument lies a rock-rim canyon where peoples from different cultures have struggled to exist for centuries. Here on the site of the Desert Queen Ranch, they pitted their creative energies and skills against an environment that dictated the terms by which it allowed them to stay. This is the story of their common resourcefulness and ingenuity in meeting the challenge of the desert. Some of the ancestors of the more recent Serrano, Shimwebi, and Kawea Indians wandered into this desert area about 900 years ago. Their lives revolved around the wealth that the natural environment could offer. Each spring, small groups moved through the mountain valleys, hunting and gathering food, until cold weather prompted their departure in early winter. Canyon walls echoed with activity, for here some of their daily needs were provided by the land. Mesquite beans, acorns, pinion nuts, and other edible plants were dried and ground into meal with grinding stones. Other plants provided fibers for baskets, wood for weapons, and fuel for cooking fires. Pools of water along the wash quenched their thirst and attracted the animals they hunted. Its underlying clays provided material to make pottery. The canyon's many rock shelters gave shade from the hot summer sun and protection from wind and rain. The last of these early peoples departed long ago, leaving behind their rock carvings and paintings to baffle even the skilled archaeologists of today. Graceful pottery and stone tools are also silent reminders of how bountiful the desert could be to those who understand its riches. In the late 1870s, the desert once again beckoned to others. Attracted by the lush grass, the result of heavier rains and snows, came the cattlemen. Driving their stock into Queen, Lost Horse, and other nearby valleys to graze. In 1879, two cattlemen, William and James McHaney, rode into Lost Horse Valley and set up camp. The brothers in their hired hands strung wire corrals dug wells and improved springs. Canyon entrances were dammed with rock to impound rainwater. These tanks provided additional water sources for their cattle. As the years passed, the McCaneys moved their camp into this canyon and built corrals, an adobe barn, and several other adobe structures utilizing clay from beneath the wash. Later their herds and others were supplemented with cattle stolen in Arizona driven to this area, rebranded and reportedly hidden in well-concealed canyons, this activity gave Hidden Valley its name. Although the cattle business proved slow, this desert with its mountains and canyons offered greater resources beneath its surface. In 1894, gunfire exploded the desert silence. A prospector lay dead. And within a year, the McKinney brothers gained possession of the Desert Queen mine. They brought a stamp mill from Los Angeles and set it up on the banks of the wash near their camp. Rich gold-bearing ore was shipped six miles by wagon across Queen Valley to the mill site for crushing. Sudden wealth produced wild spending and indebtedness for the McKinney's and caused them to lose the mind and eventually the mill. 
Like others, they were to learn that the desert has its price for those seeking quick riches at the land's expense. About 1909, a man came to this area who was to spend the next 60 years of his life trying to meet the tremendous challenge of survival presented by the desert. He would be molded by the environment that he sought to tame. Man and nature were to become a close union, one of giving and taking. This man was William F. Keyes, and the desert would become his home. Working as a watchman and assayer at the Desert Queen Mine, he was to acquire possession of it in payment for back wages owed him when its owner died. He homesteaded the canyon and brought Francis May Lawton from Los Angeles as his bride. For them, gold and water would form the basis for a unique lifestyle in an environment that would defeat many others. Together using ingenuity, patience, and hard work, William and Francis Keyes would build a life for themselves, raise a family, and cope with the harsh realities of the desert. They recognized the value of water as a life's blood survival in an arid land. The existing wells in a small lake left by the McKinney's proved inadequate for the needs of the growing Keyes family. Through the years, additional wells were dug, windmills, pumps, and an irrigation system were installed. Willis Keyes, one of the four living children of William and Francis, grew up at the ranch. On a return visit with his wife, Gwen, he recounted some of his childhood experiences. This is the old Fairbanks Morris Model Z that we used to pump water with. The pump was out here by the well, and the long belt ran from the engine to the pump. And the old engine, you had to start it by hand. Take it and swing the flywheel and start it up. He had uh, so water cooled, and this pot held the water. Mm -hmm. Notice the uh, how the sun has turned the glass of the oil oiler there. Yeah. Turned it purple. Pretty. Uh -huh. Pretty. As wells were dug, some of the clay was used to repair the adobe barn and to begin raising the walls of an adobe house, which was never finished. Later, the Keys family built a hopper to store clay for future use. But the desert is fickle. It can readily destroy that which it has provided. When a storm washed out the earthen dam, its waters poured through the gap, destroying the family's well-stocked root cellars. Undefeated, the Keyes family replaced the dam with one of concrete and rock, utilizing the same hard granites which form the canyon walls. Through the years, it grew higher as additions to it were made, further ensuring the chances of the family survival. The family's well-being grew with this rain-fed lake, and many of their activities, unusual in the desert, centered around it. Planted with black bass, bluegill and catfish, it provided ice skating during winter, a welcome swim after hot summer chores, and most important, the ranch's primary water needs. From the lake ran pipes carrying water to the garden and orchard below. Lake sediments and cow manure enriched the sandy garden soil. Here, well-tended grape arbors and fruit trees shaded vegetables and alfalfa. This was one of the old, original pear trees, probably planted about 1914. My dad uh, had to blast these places for them. The ground was so hard, adobe. And he'd drill about four holes and shoot it with dynamite to loosen the ground enough so these trees could root, take root and grow. Really hard. And uh, of course, we had uh, apples and pears, peaches and plums and uh, they all did real well. Willis and his family were almost totally self-sufficient and took pride in their independence. Three to four months sometimes elapsed between the long and rough trips to Banning or Indio. 
there, the family purchased quantities of sugar, coffee, salt, potatoes, and oranges, things that could not be grown at the ranch and stored them away for future use. The family butchered their own cattle and chickens. Small caves in the surrounding rock walls provided cool places where the beef was hung from wires to dry. Later, it was canned along with fruits and vegetables from the garden. Sometimes these canning operations took a week when the family prepared several hundred jars, a winter's supply. It was quite a chore to can. It had to be prepared first, cut and so forth. And then uh, it had to be boiled for four hours in order to can it in the fruit jars. Uh, four hours? Had to keep the fire going, old wood fire. These jars were put in a wash boiler and had to boil steadily for four hours. And then they were taken out and we'd put in another batch. Well, who would keep the fire going? I usually kept the fire going. Get the wood over there and be sure that they didn't stop boiling. The girls They're... help with keeping the jars coming? Oh, yeah. They help peel the uh, fruit and uh, take the seeds out in the pits. And my dad was there, too, also. The, the uh, fruit had to be packed carefully in the jars along with the juice, the prepared juice to put in it. The desert was relentless in its demands on the family, and both ranch visitors and family members helped with the seemingly endless chores. When we were growing up here, uh, my brother and sisters, it seemed like uh, as we got older, uh, the amount of chores increased. Uh, to start with, I think I started by keeping the water bucket full in the kitchen. And then uh, a little later, I had to keep the cooler pan full for the desert cooler. And, uh, of course, we had several goats, milk goats, and they had to be milked every day along with the two cows, usually two, sometimes one, and uh, they had to be fed. The chickens had to be fed and the eggs gathered and uh, always seemed to be uh, a chore to do, and that had to be done first. Mr. Keyes took care of the heavier work. When he wasn't away working on one of his mining claims or mills, he was busy at the ranch cutting firewood or making repairs. A man of many trades and skills, he quarried, shaped, and fitted stones into place to build dams and retaining walls. Miners and neighboring homesteaders brought gold ore to be milled and assayed, harness and horseshoes to be mended, and spare parts to be traded in the congenial atmosphere of the ranch. They also sought his skill at the forge and anvil as he made and repaired needed equipment. Although Banning was the closest town, equipment and tools lay strewn across the desert for the taking. Abandoned mines yielded up many items that could be adapted to practical ranch use. Milled lumber, a rare commodity, gradually found its way from mine cabins and shafts into ranch buildings and corrals. Boards were often reused many times for a variety of purposes. The family salvaged pipes, rails, wire, timbers, even household goods, and brought them back to the ranch for storage. Necessity became the mother of invention in an environment that required not only a strong back, but a resourceful mind just to meet the day-to-day -day struggle for survival. A discarded gold pan saw a second chance as a mixing bowl for cement. Worn-out bed springs became the steel reinforcement for concrete walls while a leaky pail could be salvaged, mended, and used again. Two cyanide vats hauled from a nearby mine, bolted together and fitted with a door and windows, protected chickens from coyotes. Later, the same chicken coop would be used to store harness and tack away from the gnawing mice and pack rats. Anything that could be repaired or reused was collected and stored at the ranch for future use. Eventually, Mr. Keyes acquired a number of old cars and trucks, plus a good quantity of old tires. Today's blown-out tire could patch a pipe split by winter cold. 
Parts from one vehicle showed up as a repair job on another. If a vital piece of machinery or vehicle broke down, a trip to town to obtain parts was often out of the question. For this reason, a small junkyard was purchased to provide a readily available supply of parts. The ranch house expanded as the family increased in size, bedrooms grew out of airy porches, and the kitchen changed locations several times. The only heating we had for the main part of the house was the fireplace. On cold winter nights, uh, the old house, of course, had no insulation, so we had to keep it stoked up pretty good. And uh, we'd all take a brick to bed with us that we'd heat it in the fireplace, wrap it up in newspaper and maybe a towel or something and put it in the bed. And boy, that really helped. <laughs> and then in the kitchen, of course, it was a wood stove also. It uh, kept the kitchen part pretty uh, warm in the wintertime. It kept it warm in the summertime, too. By the way, it was a hot place to work. My mother used to uh, do all the cooking, and she did most of it from memory. As far as uh, recipes were concerned, she uh, could remember just the right proportions, apparently, because it was always good. And people coming through, they tried to uh, make it in here somewhere around mealtime, because they always knew they'd get a good meal. When we didn't have beef, occasionally uh, we couldn't butcher because the stock wasn't ready, and we didn't want to butcher beef unless it was ready. So we'd have uh, maybe rabbit, cottontail, jackrabbit, or chicken, or something like that. And she could uh, really make uh, some good meals out of that. She had uh, a lot of her own ideas that she used. Uh, in the, for breakfast, that was a, a real large meal, something that when I got away from home, I found out it wasn't the, the normal thing. <laughs> But we got up early and did a good part of our chores before breakfast. Then came in and had uh, oatmeal or cornmeal mush, a good large bowl, and then maybe pancakes and eggs and bacon, or possibly steaks and biscuits and gravy. Uh, so it was always a good large uh, meal of the day. Like most other chores, Wash Day united an already closely knit family. Oh, and Wash Day, yeah. Uh, usually about every two weeks we'd have a wash day, and it took most of the day to do it. Huh. Uh, we had this old washing machine that was uh, gasoline engine driven. It usually took a couple of hours in the morning to get things all started. You had to build a fire under the wash tub to heat the water and get the gasoline engine going fill the tubs and the washing machine with the warm, hot water, and start in. And we'd all get out and help with that. Uh, a couple of them at the washing machine, putting the stuff in, taking it out, running it through the ringers, and then take it out and hang it up on the line to dry. So it was about a full day's chore to do a, uh, the collection of two weeks' wash. A little bit different than we do nowadays. Somewhat, yeah. From an early age, Willis, his brother, and three sisters learned from their parents to be aware of desert dangers. Rattlesnakes were frequently encountered, but no one was ever bitten. Since the nearest doctor lived more than 50 miles away, even a minor accident could become a major catastrophe. All but serious illnesses were treated at the ranch by Francis Keyes, who consulted a set of medical encyclopedias to supplement many home remedies. School days began when Oren Booth, a qualified teacher working as a ranch hand, started the first formal classes in a schoolhouse that Bill Keyes had built. Neighboring homesteaders later started to send their children to the ranch, and a larger schoolhouse resulted with the county taking over payment of the teacher's salary. The isolation of the ranch drove many of the teachers away after a year or two's stay. Nevertheless, the Desert Queen School operated for about 10 years. The students published the Desert Queen Herald, a small newspaper. Poems, articles, and artwork reflected the influence of the desert in shaping their young lives. The school closed its doors in 1942 when the younger Keyes children were old enough to attend high school in town.
last 20 years at the Desert Queen Ranch were quiet ones for Mr. and Mrs. Keyes. Rock piles no longer reverberated to the shouts of children who had left to establish their own lives. The mines had shut down and gold ore no longer poured through the Keyes stamp mills. Cattle were sold and most of the homesteaders moved away. In the late 1960s, the ranch property and the Desert Queen mine were sold to become part of the Joshua Tree National Monument. Bill Keyes continued to live at the ranch, caring for it until his death in 1969 at the age of 89. He was buried beside his wife in the family cemetery at his beloved Desert Queen Ranch to become part of the canyon he loved and labored for during his 60 years of residence. His tombstone, like the rest of those there, had been cut by his own hands from the native stone of the area. The ranch lies silent now, except when coyotes howl from rock ledges above. Gamble's quail strut where chickens once flocked and shared the dominion with others. Restless winds blow through wall chinks and rattle sheets of tin on rooftops. Buildings lean at drunken angles, while neglected machinery rusts with the change of seasons. Pack rats, stockpiling food and nesting materials in old cars and in buildings, prove that the homesteading spirit is still very much alive. The desert in which William Keyes made significant victories has already begun to reclaim its canyon. One culture passes and another one comes. Each has tried to mold a desert to its own needs, but has instead been molded. For man, like the plants and animals, is a product of his environment. Today, the desert beckons to man once again. The Joshua Tree National Monument they come from nearby metropolitan areas and from around the world to be challenged and inspired by what the desert has to offer. While these personal challenges are not as difficult as the ones encountered by those who first settled here, they are no less important. For well, here, modern man can learn more about himself and his place in the world around him. The lessons learned from the Desert Queen Ranch can stimulate him in the search. The desert is eternal. Clouds pass over it, and rainstorms drench it quickly. Yet the desert survives to lie beneath the hot, empty sky. Mm -hmm.